45 minutes, then it will, then okay. it will be break and your presentation, please. Okay, thank you very much. I will start sharing the screen now. Let's hope this works. You should see the screen and if we go to full screen. So you should be seeing the full screen right now, I hope. Yes. Okay, we so uh, move on. Okay, welcome everyone. And uh, as Alec mentioned, today I'm going to give you an overview of uh, data simulation and inverse modeling of atmospheric trace constituents. And since I know this is an area with which many of you are not familiar, I'm going to spend a little bit of time at the beginning introducing the, the subject matter and then go through some examples of the use of data simulation and inverse modeling in this area of research. As many of you are aware, I'm sure that you know, much of the motivation for this work is due to the fact that human activity has profoundly changed the composition of the atmosphere. And that has implications for climate as well as for air quality. In an air quality context, it is now well established that air pollution is a major, is a major cause of human mortality globally. The images here from the Cohen et al. study shows this unfortunate reality. The top panel shows deaths in 2015 due to fine particulate matter exposure. These are this is PM 2.5. These are small particulates that are less than 2.5 microns in diameter. This is showing the percentage of total deaths in each of the countries uh, in 2015 due to PM 2.5 exposure. And just to give you, know, if you can't see the numbers clearly, this, this is on the order from you know, three all the way up to more than 9% of total deaths due to particulate matter exposure. In 2015, they estimated there were about 4 million deaths globally associated with uh, particulate exposure. For ozone, the picture is less grim, but equally unfortunate. The numbers here, the scales are different. The numbers here are the percentage of deaths per 100,000 people. And Cohen et al estimated that in 2015, there were about a quarter of a million deaths globally due to ozone exposure. And so from an air quality perspective to develop effective air quality regulation strategies, we need reliable estimates of emissions of pollutants on policy relevant scales. In addition, there's also a need to understand how emission of pollutants will impact the global atmosphere and how those changes in the global atmosphere will in turn influence local air quality. And this information is needed everywhere because every country is impacted by this problem. Uh, in North America, for example, we've seen significant improvements in air quality as a result of air quality regulations. But despite those improvements, there are still large numbers of people who are living in regions where the ozone uh, abundances, for example, exceed the uh, air quality standard. The plot on the top left here shows measurements of NO2. NO2 is a compound that is a precursor gas to ozone, so it leads to the production of ozone in the atmosphere. It's not, NO2 is not emitted, but it's created from NO, nitric oxide, which is emitted from high temperature combustion, and NO very quickly forms NO2, which very quickly forms ozone. So if you have NO2, you will make ozone. This shows satellite observations from the OMI instrument of the vertically integrated column abundance of NO2 over North America in 2005 and in 2013. And you can see the red color showing high abundances of this ozone precursor gas decreasing significantly when we get to 2013. So very dramatic reduction in the abundance of NO2 in the atmosphere of North America as a result of air quality regulations over the past two decades. Associated with this reduction in NO2, since NO2 is a precursor gas, we see reductions in ozone. This plot is showing urban trends in surface ozone. The arrows indicate the direction of the trend and the magnitude of the trend. Downward pointing arrows, indicate a negative trend. And so you can see ozone is decreasing pretty much in most of the urban areas across the United States and in Southern Canada as well. However, according to the US EPA in 2019, there were over 70, there were about 74 million Americans who were living in regions where uh, ozone abundances exceeded the air quality standard. In Canada, it's about 8 million people, a comparable fraction of our population still living in areas where ozone is an issue. So despite the improvements, there's still a long way to go and there's critical need for 
top-down, as we call it, inverse modeling estimates of changing emissions of uh, pollutants over, you know, the, how the pollutants are changing in time so that we can better uh, target the various pollutants that are important to, uh, to improve the, the, the health situation. And much of the talk that I'm going to uh, give today will be focused on inverse modeling of these uh, pollutants. Another key issue that we face as a global society is the dramatic rise in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. The fact that human activity is significantly perturbing the global carbon cycle, which of course is leading to dramatic changes in the climate system. The figure here on the left shows, it's a, sort of the canonical picture, if you will, of the CO2 record from Mauna Loa in Hawaii. The red curve shows the monthly mean CO2 concentration as measured at Mauna Loa. And you can see this strong seasonal cycle due to the fact that in summer, across much of the Northern hemisphere in boreal summer, we have uh, significant vegetation growth. The leaves come out on the trees. There's strong uptake of CO2 by, due to the pho photosynthetic activity that leads to this drop in CO2 that we see in the atmosphere. In winter, photosynthesis is uh, suppressed and we have net respiration, net emission of CO2 to the atmosphere. And that drives this seasonal cycle, which effectively you know, looks like we're watching the biosphere breathe as we go through the seasonal cycles. The black line is the deseasonalized curve showing the very constant increase in CO2 over time due to human activity. So this increase that you see here is really being driven by fossil fuel emissions to the atmosphere. Now, however, uh, as bad as this is, we are somewhat fortunate in that only about 50% of the CO2 that we emit to the atmosphere remain in the atmosphere. The rest of it is taken up by the oceans and the biosphere. And how that, what that, how that partitioning is changing is shown here on the right. The top part of the panel shows the emissions as a function of time from the 1800s to the present. And you can see this significant increase over time due to fossil fuel emissions. There's also land use change, which contributes to CO2 emissions to the atmosphere. As I said, not all of that uh, CO2 remains in the atmosphere. This, some of it is taken up by the ocean. So the blue colors here indicate the ocean uptake. And then there's a fraction that's taken up by the land. And then the residual that remains in the atmosphere is indicated by the light blue. If you look at the land sink, you can see there's significant variability over time. So, so large seasonal variations are due to the biosphere, but also interannual vari variations are also due to the land biosphere that drives variations in atmospheric CO2. So if we want to make reliable projections as to how atmospheric CO2 concentrations will evolve in the future, it's really critical that we're able to model how the biosphere component will change with time because this biospheric signal uh, component is, is highly variable and it's sensitive to changes in climate. El Nino, La Nina variations will lead to changes in the biosphere. Long-term changes in climate will affect the biospheric sink, which will in turn will then feed back on atmospheric CO2 levels and as a result, global warming. So it's critical that we model how the biospheric changes in time. And unfortunately at the moment, our terrestrial biospheric models do not do a very good job of simulating these biospheric fluxes. This figure shows five uh, CO2 fluxes in summer, boreal summer, from five different terrestrial biospheric models. Ignore the units, I didn't plot the units here, and uh, the color bar doesn't have any gradations. The main point here is for you to focus on the spatial patterns and the intensity of the colors. It's during the summer, boreal summer, when we have significant photosynthetic uptake across the Northern Hemisphere due to the uh, vegetation growth. And so you see blue colors indicating a sink of CO2 across much of the high latitude Northern Hemisphere. But as you look across the five different models, you see that there's a fairly large spread in the fluxes. You have SIB3 versus the C10 crew and SEP model, for example. This is suggesting a much weaker uptake of CO2 than the crew and set model. Spatially, the models all seem to be consistent, which is great, but the magnitude of the uptake varies dramatically. And so a key objective of the inverse modeling community is to use atmospheric CO2 observations to try to obtain robust estimates of regional sources and sinks of CO2 that can be used by process-based models like these 
to try to improve our understanding of the terrestrial biosphere, the biosphere processes, and hopefully in doing so, then be able to make more reliable projections of how atmospheric C2 levels may evolve in the future. To also go after atherogenic emissions, because there's a growing interest in using atmospheric CO2 measurements in an inverse modeling context to quantify atherogenic emissions from fossil fuel combustion, for example, we need to be able to reliably estimate what the biosphere is doing so that we can tease out what the human signal is. So both of those uh, issues uh, you know, are, are driving this, this inverse modeling work that we're doing as part of the community. Now, a challenge that we face in doing this is to develop an effective observing system that will provide the information needed to allow us to constrain these fluxes on regional scales to get robust fluxes on regional scales. And to give you a sense of the challenge of developing this observing network, I have this animation here. This is a model simulation of CO2. This is from the Environment and Climate Change Carbon Assimilation System. There's no simulation in this particular animation. This is just the model simulation of CO2. The white colors represents high levels of CO2, the dark colors, lower levels of CO2. And in spring, coming out of winter, you can see the CO2 being exported from the continental regions in Asia, North America, and being transported around the world. You see the strong synoptic signatures. Effectively, you're looking at CO2 weather here uh, as the uh, emissions are dispersed globally. As we move into summer, you're starting to see some dark colors emerging. This is the uptake signal from the biosphere as the biosphere starts to draw down CO2 in, in summer, and that signal also gets exported globally. Now, in the context of the inversion, it's the gradients that you see here, the transport pat patterns acting on the sources and sinks of CO2 that provides the information that we need for our inversion analyses. And as you can see, the system here is incredibly variable. So the challenge that we face is to develop an observing system that's able to capture this incredibly varying uh, system. So we need to be able to have sufficient spatial and temporal resolution to capture a lot of the structure that you see here. And much of the early inverse modeling work that was done starting in the late 80s and early 90s relied on a surface observing network that was fairly sparse and couldn't really provide the kinds of constraints that were needed to allow us to estimate these fluxes on, uh, on regional scales. So this is what's driven the investment in new satellite technology over the last 20 years. Space agencies around the world have invested significant resources in developing space-based observations to allow us to more densely sample this, uh, this state and hopefully provide the information that's needed so that we can get estimates of these fluxes on policy relevant scales for both you know, carbon cycle uh, applications as well as air quality. So here's a picture of the NASA Earth fleet. This is a very NASA centric view of the world, unfortunately, uh, but we have similar investments being made uh, across uh, other space agencies in the world. These satellites uh, that are listed here are not all just for atmospheric com composition, of course. Yeah, it's for all of Earth science. You can, there's a SMAP mission here, for example, which uh, Fabio talked about yesterday. This is the Soil Moisture and Active Passive uh, mission that was launched in 2015. And uh, the, the Landsat missions. I'm going to focus on a couple of the, the missions here. I'm going to talk a bit about the Terra mission, um, in particular, one instrument on Terra. There's the Aura mission. This also had a number of composition uh, instruments on board. And there's still uh, many of those instruments are still operational. As you move into the future, we have instruments like Tempo, which is a geostationary instrument that's, uh, that will be launched next year, as well as GeoCarb. That's another geostationary instrument. And I'll also talk a little bit about the Orbiting Carbon Observatory, OCO2, that was launched in 2014. So how do we make these measurements uh, of these trace gases from space? Clearly, from space, we cannot make in situ measurements. We can only rely on the radiation field that's emanating from the atmosphere. And so to walk through how we do these, uh, this inverse uh, analysis to estimate the trace gas concentrations given the measured radiation field, I'm going to use MOPIT as an example. MOPIT is the measurement of pollution in the troposphere. And it was launched on the Terra spacecraft that I just pointed out in December of 1999. It was supposed to be a five-year mission and it's still operating well this December. It will be 22 years 
in orbit. Uh, the instrument actually was designed here at the University of Toronto and uh, Jim Drummond is the PI of the instrument. And this was the first instrument designed specifically to measure pollution in the troposphere. And the troposphere is that lower 10 kilometer of the atmosphere where you have convective overturning that drives a lot of the weather that we're familiar with. <laughs> to measure carbon monoxide, CO, Moppet measures radiation in two parts of the spectrum. In the near infrared part of the spectrum, around 2.3 microns, in which the satellite looks at the absorption signature of CO2 in reflected uh, solar radiation. And in the thermal infrared part of the spectrum, around 4.6 microns, in which we are looking at thermal emission of CO, of CO uh, from the atmosphere. And the way the retrieval works, it's, it's based on a Bayesian approach, uh, inverse modeling approach, in which we have a set of measurements, Y, which are the measured radiances. So these would be the level one data that Fabio talked about yesterday. And given those measured radiances in the different parts of the spectrum, we want to infer the atmospheric concentration abundance of CO that would have produced the measured radiances. And so X in this case are the retrieve profiles and this is, these retrieve profiles are referred to as level two products. So we try to go from a level one product to a level two product when we do the inversion. And we, as I said, for the Moffitt retrievals and for many of the retrievals today from these uh, atmospheric composition instruments, we take a Bayesian approach to do the optimization. And going back to uh, Colin's lecture on Tuesday, if we consider a linear model that relates our observations to our state of interest, so X here is the state that we're trying to quantify given knowledge of the, uh, of the system based on the observations Y. And we have an observation operator here that maps the state into the uh, measurement space. So if we assume we have a linear model and further, let's assume we have Gaussian errors, uh, which Colin talked about on Tuesday, the maximum a posteriori estimate, which is the state, yeah, they, so the, I actually mentioned the maximum a posteriori estimator is an approach that tries to maximize the conditional PDF, but to give us a state that, that maximizes the conditional PDF. And so the map maximum a posteriori estimator is obtained by minimizing this cost function, assuming that we have Gaussian error statistics. And what you're looking at here is an innovation, which is the observations, minus the projection of our model state into the observation space. And just recalling the nomenclature that, that Colin introduced on, on Tuesday. So we have the information coming from the observations here constrained by our prior knowledge of the system with XB is the background or a priori estimate of the state with an observation error, with a, with a background error covariance B and an error covariance for the observations R. So if we minimize this cost function, we get a solution for the uh, state, so our, our analysis given by this expression here. And I've listed it in two different forms uh, because what you decide to use for your analysis really will depend on the particular problem that you're working on. So if you have a situation in which, for example, your state space is much smaller than your observation space, so N, is much smaller than M, then this would be the preferred form to use because this matrix would be much smaller than the matrix here. This form is, fair, is used very often in the satellite inverse modeling community because our state space typically consists of maybe 100 levels in the atmosphere for the trace gas of interest. And the measurement space can be tens of thousands of, uh, of elements in spectral space. For the atmospheric inversion problem, which I will talk about as well, this is often the preferred form. And you may be more familiar with this form of the expression of the analytical solution to this inverse problem, assuming Gaussian errors and a linear model. Uh, because often for our atmospheric models, the state space is usually, uh, is usually much, much larger than the observation space. And then of course, the analysis error covariance matrix is given by this expression here. So what do the retrievals actually look like? Uh, I'm going to show you an example of this approach applied to the retrieval of Moffitt data, starting with the level one radiances, Y, and ending with the profile 
of carbon monoxide X. So here's an example from a paper by Jim Crawford et al. from 2004. Remember Moppet was launched in 1999. And so we're seeing the first uh, set of observations coming from Moppet being used by the community. And in this paper, they were looking at Moppet data and comparing those data to aircraft profiles over the North Pacific as part of a NASA aircraft campaign called Trace P. So this was an aircraft mission that NASA uh, had over the North Pacific in spring of 2001 to measure the export of pollution from Asia over the North Pacific to North America. And they took advantage of the fact that Moppet was in orbit at the time to isolate uh, particular overpasses of the satellite that coincided with aircraft measurements so that they could compare the measured carbon monoxide from Moppet with the measured carbon monoxide from the aircraft flying over the North Pacific. So these profiles shown here are for coincidence, coincidence, uh, coincidences over uh, the North Pacific around 20 degrees north near the dateline. So on the plot here, we have as a function of altitude in pressure units, the mid troposphere about five kilometers is around the 500 hectopascal level showing carbon monoxide as a function of altitude. If we focus on the aircraft profiles, there are two different aircraft profiles here, the P3B and the DC-8. We see as we move up from the surface, a significant increase in carbon monoxide. The units here are parts per billion, and then a decrease back to more background conditions. What you're seeing here is a pollution plume that's been lifted off of Asia. In spring, you tend to have cold fronts that come down from Siberia, that lifts the pollution from Asia into the mid troposphere and over the North Pacific. So you can see this fairly localized pollution plume over the North Pacific here. And both aircraft measurements are picking up that signal very nicely. The thin black line here is showing the average of the aircraft profiles. And you can see very nicely here, this pollution plume that's fairly localized in, in, in altitude. The Moppet measurement is the thick black line. And you know, when the first set of Moppet data became available, there was a lot of confusion as to what are we actually seeing with Moppet. Because at first glance, when you look at this Moppet profile, the thick black line, it doesn't match what the aircraft is seeing at all. And we expected that the Moppet instrument would, be, would smooth the atmosphere, would not be able to provide measurements at fairly high uh, vertical resolution. Uh, but if you were to take the aircraft profile and smooth that, you would get something that looks like the thick dashed line here, which still does not look like the Moppet profile, the thick black line. So there's a lot of confusion initially in the community as to how do we make sense of these uh, remote sensing observations. Keep in mind, this Moppet was the first instrument that you know, took this sort of a Bayesian inverse modeling approach to provide this kind of uh, uh, space-based observations of pollution in the lower part of the atmosphere. So to make sense of why Moppet looks like this compared to why to the aircraft profile that clearly shows this pollution plume signature, we need to think about the smoothing influence of the retrieval of the inverse uh, of the inversion that we're conducting here. So if we go back to our analytical expression for the analysis, this is our background guess, plus the increment from the inversion. Uh, going back to the nomenclature from Colin, we have our innovation. This is our gain matrix, which uh, gives us, you know, when we multiply the gain matrix, which we can write as K, uh, uh, and the innovation, we get the increment that's added back to our background to provide uh, our estimate of the analysis. But we do have, we can take this a little bit further. We have an estimate of a model that relates the observations Y to the, the true state. And that is our linear model that takes this true state and maps it into the observation space. But of course our instrument has errors. And so we have an observation error epsilon that we have to account for. So we can substitute Y into our expression here. And in doing so, we have an expression for the analysis in which we now substitute our observation model for Y that is of this form. And we're going to take the product of K times H. So the gain matrix times the observation operator and we'll call that A. Now in this form, this looks, should look a little familiar to, to, to many of you. We can think of this 
as a linearization of the analysis around our background state, where A is the sensitivity of the analysis with respect to the true state. But as I said, you know, in this expression here, A is just K times H, so the gain matrix times our observation operator, but we can just think of it as the sensitivity of the analysis to the true state. We now can substitute our expression for the gain matrix here back into our expression for A. So we have an equation of this form. And with a little bit of algebra, we can write it uh, as that A is equal to the identity matrix minus the analysis error covariance matrix times the inverse of our background error covariance matrix, a priori error covariance matrix. Now, if A is indeed the sensitivity of the analysis with respect to the true state, ideally we would like to have an A matrix that is the identity matrix that suggests that we have perfect sensitivity to the, uh, the true state. And if that were the case for a state vector X that consists of uh, N components, if we take the trace of A, we would get N and that would be the total degrees of freedom for sigma that we have. It would suggest we have perfect sensitivity to each element of our state vector in our inversion analysis. In reality, that's often not the case. And that's critical. Understanding that is critical to understanding why the Moffat retrievals look the way they do. So let's go back to that example and look at the Moffat retrievals. So what we have here are, this is the same plot that I showed you before, but now I've added the averaging kernels of the Moffat retrievals. So actually, let me go back and walk you through one more thing. So this is the sensitivity of the analysis to the true state. And so this matrix is going to be an N by N matrix, but it's not going to be symmetric. And each row of the matrix tells you the sensitivity of a given element in the retrieve state to all of the other elements, components of the retrieve state. So keep that in mind. And what's plotted here are the, is the averaging kernel matrix. And in particular, each line is one row of that averaging kernel matrix. So if we look at the line with the open circles, that's the averaging kernel for the surface level of the profile retrieval. And it's telling us what is the sensitivity of the retrieved carbon monoxide at the surface to all of the other levels in the state vector X. And there, in this case, this was a seven element uh, state vector. And you can see that at the surface, the sensitivity of the retrieval to CO at the surface is quite small. So the average kernel is quite small there. The surface carbon monoxide has greater sensitivity to CO in the mid troposphere, not at the surface. If we look at the 850 hectopascal retrieval, that's the open triangles, that also has low sensitivity at the surface, low sensitivity also at the 850 hectopascal with the sensitivity peaking around 500 hectopascal right in the middle troposphere around five kilometers. And there are two things to keep in mind here. What this means is that when you look at a Moffat retrieval and you look at the profile of carbon monoxide, the estimate that you're getting near the surface is not really a true reflection of the CO at that surface because the instrument sensitivity to CO there is quite low. And so to a large degree, you're seeing the background information being reflected in your version rather than actual information from the, from the, 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 the true state itself. So the average kernels provides a way of characterizing the, 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 the smoothing inference or the sensitivity of the inversion to the, uh, the actual state. And I should add, actually add, make one more interesting point here, which I'll, I'll get to later on, but I think it's worth mentioning it here, is that the reason the sensitivity is low here is because these retrievals are relying on radiance measurements in the infrared part of the spectrum, around 4.6 microns. And when you get near the surface, it's very difficult to discriminate between thermal emission coming from the ground versus thermal emission coming from the atmosphere just above the ground. So only instances where you have significant thermal contrast between the ground and the air above it 
will you be able to discriminate uh, you know, thermal emissions from the atmosphere versus thermal uh, radiation from the ground? And so for these thermal infrared uh, instruments, sensitivity near the ground is very problematic. And in this particular case, we're looking at a retrieval over the North Pacific, the North, the Pacific Ocean in early spring where conditions are quite cold. And so there's very little sensitivity to carbon monoxide emissions near the surface. Given the smoothing influence of the, of the retrieval and the fact that we can think of the retrieval as this linear expansion around the background state, to properly compare the aircraft data to Moppet, we need to account for the smoothing influence of Moppet and the biasing influence of the background information that went into the Moppet inversions. And so we can take the same expression that we have for this uh, retrieval, this linear relationship, and substitute you know, the true profile, which we don't really know, but the retrieval is giving us an estimate of the true profile. But now we can say, well, what if the aircraft profile were the true profile in the atmosphere? Well, we can subtract the background state from that and apply the averaging kernel to get an increment that we add back to the background state. And in doing so, we're taking the aircraft profile and transforming it into the instrument space, the Moppet space, so that we can make a proper comparison between Moppet and the aircraft profile in the Moppet measurement space. So if you take the aircraft profile, the thin black line, and apply this expression here, where we substitute the true state you know, you know, with the aircraft profile, we get this process line that is this thick gray line. So now this looks much more like what Moppet actually saw, this th thick black line. And this is telling us that Moppet is indeed seeing this pollution plume. But because of the smoothing influence of the retrieval and the fact that we have low sensitivity near the surface, we can't capture this signature fairly well, but we can't, we can't isolate the signature in space, but the information is actually there in the retrieval nevertheless, but in a very smooth representation. And so you know, we can now compare the two and these two look much more similar than this thick line and the thin black line from the aircraft. The conclusion, one of the conclusions in this Crawford and Al paper was that these results provide insight on the sources of variability, both real and artificial in satellite observations, and that understanding these sources of variability is important if Moppet observations are to be quantitatively useful. And indeed, you know, Moppet has provided, has provided the longest continuous measurements of carbon monoxide from space, and the, measure, the measurements have been fantastically useful. But there was a significant learning curve in the community initially to understand how to interpret these remote sensing measurements because of the significant smoothing influence of the inversion in going from the measured radiances to the uh, concentration profiles of carbon monoxide. And this applies for other instruments as well, other trace gases as well. For example, here is an example of a retrieval of ozone from the tropospheric emission spectrometer. TESS, Tropospheric Emission Spectrometer, is an instrument on the Aura spacecraft that was launched in July 2004. There were four instruments on board, of which TESS was one. TESS, unfortunately, is no longer operational. It was decommissioned in 2018. However, it was a five-year mission, and the instrument worked wonderfully from 2004 until about 2018. The instrument itself is an infrared Fourier transform spectrometer that measures radiation in the thermal infrared part of the spectrum from three to 15 microns. And ozone is estimated in the atmosphere from measuring emission, ozone thermal emission around 9.6 microns where there's a strong ozone uh, uh, emission uh, band. Now, if you look at the averaging kernel for the ozone retrieval, you get something that looks like this. This is one measurement on the eastern seaboard of North America at 30 degrees north, 87 west, on the 15th of August, 2016. Each line is one row of the average internal matrix. The retrieval here was done on a 65 level grid. So the average internal is a 65 by 65 matrix with each row of the average internal indicating the sensitivity of the retrieval on a given level to, all, to, to ozone on all of the other 65 levels. So if we plot the individual rows of the average kernel matrix, we get something that looks like this. And in this paper, Mark Carrington, uh, who's a postdoc in our group, at the time 
color coded the various retrieval levels. So all of the levels in the lower part of the troposphere between 1,000 and 500 hectopascals are color coded in red. And as we move up in altitude, the levels between 500 and 150 hectopascals are color coded in green. And then the levels in the stratosphere from about 16 kilometers to, uh, to about 25 kilometers are color coded in blue. So the first thing to note as with the Moppet retrieval, if we look at one of the lower tropospheric retrieval levels, so one of these red lines, we see that the sensitivity to ozone near the surface is quite small. Again, it's a thermal infrared measurement. And so it cannot really discriminate between variations in thermal emission uh, coming from the ground versus variations in thermal emissions coming from ozone just above the ground. We just don't have that sensitivity. But we see that the sensitivity peaks around 800 hectopascals. So around you know, one to two kilometers is where we, can, we actually start to get sensitivity to variations in ozone. And the instrument can now start to uh, detect the changes in the radiation field associated with changes in ozone at those levels. But the fact that these red lines all look the same and essentially fall on top of each other, and these red lines correspond to all of the retrieval levels from the surface to about five kilometers, is saying that we can't really discriminate, though, between the change in the radiation field due to a change in ozone at two kilometers versus a change in the radiation field due to a change in ozone at four kilometers. So the measurement, even though it, we're providing a profile on a 65 level grid, the measurement itself is highly correlated. And the averaging kernel captures that correlation structure to some extent. So instead of getting 65 independent pieces of information for the 60, uh, 65 level uh, retrieval, for this particular retrieval, we uh, obtained about four pieces of information. So four independent pieces of information from the retrieval, despite the fact that it's a 65 level grid throughout the whole atmosphere. If we look only at the lower part of the atmosphere, the troposphere, so the first 10 to 12 kilometers, this particular retrieval provides about one independent piece of information. And for this particular day, if you look at the ozone retrievals across the, uh, the, the globe, so this is showing the degrees of freedom for signal, so the number of independent pieces of information that each retrieval provides on tropospheric on ozone as a function of latitude from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere, we see that for the whole profile, for the whole 67 level profile, typically we get between two and four independent pieces of information from the retrieval. If we look only at the tropospheric component, so the lowest 10 to 15 kilometers of the profile, we see that in the Northern Hemisphere, in boreal summer, we're getting maybe one to one and a half pieces of information. In the Winter Hemisphere, where it's colder, and in the Southern Hemisphere in particular, where there's mostly ocean, we're getting very little information. So less than 0.5 degrees of freedom per signal. So significant smoothing effects associated with the retrieval, and it's important to keep that in mind. This smoothing though really reflects the physics of the retrieval itself. It's, 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 it's something that we cannot work around. It, it's a fundamental aspect of the retrieval, but there are ways to get more information on the vertical structure to improve this, uh, the inverse problem and get a better constraint on the overall state. And one way of doing that is by com combining information from different parts of the spectrum. And this is something that has been pioneered with, uh, with Moppet very nicely. So if you, Look at the Moppet retrievals. You, know, you can retrieve carbon monoxide from the thermal infrared part of the spectrum, as I mentioned, at 4.6 micron. But I also said that Moppet measures around 2.3 microns as well in the near infrared part of the spectrum, where it's looking at backscattered uh, solar radiation. So you can retrieve CO in this thermal infrared part of the spectrum, as well as in the near infrared part of the spectrum. And you get very different, in from, you know, the, 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 the smoothing effects are very different depending on where you are in the spectrum. But you can also combine the TIR, the thermal infrared information, with the near infrared information, and that also will change the performance of the retrieval. And so let's take a look at what that, how that works here in the five minutes or so that we have remaining. So if we assimilate, if we do the inversion using only the thermal infrared 
retrievals, we get averaging kernels that look like these. And again, each line here is a, is a given row of the average kernel corresponding to different retrieval levels. So if we look at the, uh, this cyan color here, this is for the 700 hectopascal retrieval. And you see that that peaks around 700, eight, 7 to 800 hectopascals. There's no sensitivity near the surface and then falls off quickly with altitude. The 300 hectopascal uh, retrieval level peaks at around 300 hectopascals and then the sensitivity falls off with the altitude uh, as you go down toward the surface, which is great. For this particular retrieval, the trace of this average kernel suggests we get about one and a half pieces of information. If we use just the near infrared channel, this is looking at backscatter solar radiation, we really can't say anything about the vertical structure of carbon monoxide because you're really looking at the absorption signature of the CO molecules in the atmosphere uh, in this reflected solar radiation as measured by the satellite. And so when you look at the averaging kernel, it's they're, they're all fairly uniform with altitude because there's very little vertical information that you can get from these retrievals. You can see closer to the surface because you're looking at backscattered radiation near the ground, but you can't really say anything about changes in carbon monoxide as a function of altitude. You can really just capture the extinction uh, signature of the CO molecules. So the average kernels are fairly uniform and the degrees of freedom for signal here is about one. So there's like one piece of information. So you're getting essentially, think of it as a column integrated uh, estimate of the carbon molecules, uh, CO molecules in the atmosphere. So very different depending on where you are in the spectrum. The physics changes what the inversion provides. You can now also combine the TIR and the NIR data, as I mentioned. And if you do that, the averaging kernels now look very different. So if you compare the surface level retrieval, which is in black here, you see very little sensitivity near the surface for the black line, some peak sensitivity near 700 hectopascals, and then it falls off, but very little sensitivity to the surface. So the surface carbon monoxide retrieval has essentially very little sensitivity to carbon monoxide near the surface with the TIR. There's more sensitivity with the near, near IR, but as I said, you, don't, you can't discriminate between variations in CO and the vertical. However, when you combine the two, this is the surface level retrieval. You can see it is quite, the sensitivity is quite high. So by bringing the two together, you can use the near IR information to provide constraints on the CO variations in the lower part of the atmosphere and the TIR information to get some constraints on the mid to upper troposphere. And in doing so, you can now get close to two pieces of information. You can discriminate variations near the surface as well as variations in CO aloft at higher altitudes. And the impact of this can be shown very not seen very nicely here in this uh, comparison with uh, Moppet and aircraft profiles. This, these mosaic profiles are aircraft profiles over New Delhi. Uh, there's a typo here, my apologies for that. So this is over New Delhi on uh, the 3rd of September in 2004. So if we focus on the TIR retrievals, the aircraft profiles are shown here, our aircraft profile shown here as a red dotted line. You can see high carbon monoxide levels near the surface. This is reflecting the pollution near the ground, which falls off with altitude and then increases aloft. This C-shaped structure is typical of uh, the influence of convection. This time of the year, you tend to have a monsoon structure over, over, uh, Asia, over South Asia and you get lofting of this pollution from the surface and then convective outflow aloft, and that drives this C-shaped structure. When you look at the Moppet retrievals using just the TIR data, you get the black line. So the aircraft measurements look nothing like the Moppet measurements. And that's, as I mentioned on the last two slides, a reflection of the smoothing influence of the retrieval. With the near infrared only measurements, there's even more smoothing of the retrieval. So you get a fairly uniform profile over much of the uh, lower to middle part of the atmosphere, as opposed to some of the structures that you see here. However, when you combine the TIR and near infrared, you get the black line. This is the Moppet retrieval combining the information from those two different parts of the spectrum. And now you see this C-shaped structure showing up very nicely within the Moppet retrieval. Moppet is actually picking up the surface pollution here 
with this uh, multispectral inversion compared to using only the TIR or only the near infrared information. And if you take the aircraft profile and transform it into the instrument space using the averaging kernels and the, 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 the prior or background profile, you get the red line here. Okay. So not only is it, the Moppet looking very much like the, air, the aircraft profile by itself, but also when you transform the aircraft profile into Moppet space, they're very consistent. So this is a beautiful example of how bringing additional information from the different parts of the spectrum together can give you more constraints on the atmospheric state. And you can now start to constrain the vertical structure of carbon monoxide very effectively. And you know, the, uh, in this paper by Helen Warden, she showed you know, just how transformative this multispectral retrieval is in terms of the information that it provides on surface level CO. So keep in mind the surface level averaging kernel, the row of the average kernel for the surface level retrieval shows high sensitivity near the surface. And it, these are the average kernels again. But now if you look at the surface level carbon monoxide, and this is a five-year average of CO near the surface from the Moppet retrievals, you see the benefits of this multispectral retrieval. On the left, this is only using the thermal infrared data. And on the right is this multispectral retrieval. You can see on the left, there's some structure of the major pollution regions in Asia, but this stands out very nicely. The high, the red colors represent high levels of carbon monoxide. You can see the Indo-Gangetic plane showing up very nicely here. Uh, uh, you know, the, the Pearl River Delta, much of uh, Eastern China showing up very strong. So there's significant information that we're able to get from the multispectral retrieval on surface level CO. And so now with this kind of information, we can take this, what we call a level two Moppet data product. So we went from the, we did an inverse, an inversion analysis to go from the level one satellite radiances to level two carbon monoxide profiles. And now we can take this level two profile and do another inversion using an atmospheric model to now infer the surface emissions of carbon monoxide to the atmosphere, given the observations that we have available to us. And I'm using Moppet here as an example of how we do this. You know, this is also done for CO2, which I'll talk about methane and many other trace constituents. So the next part of the talk will focus now on taking these satellite measurements and bringing them into the atmospheric models to try to do the inversion problem in the atmospheric models to infer these emissions on policy relevant scales. So I think it is a good time to stop for the break, Alec. Okay, yeah, wonderful, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much yeah, for the first <clears throat> part. And now let's break, uh, let's uh, uh, continue at 17.00 Central European time in 10, nine minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 